Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is that you're watching this. Welcome to This Is Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next roughly half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at uh, things that I think are important enough for you to take notice of. And uh, if you have any reactions to the show, they are always welcome. You can uh, email them to me directly at my personal email, which is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website. It's called Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. And the URL will be around here somewhere a couple times during the show. You can go there. You can get the email address from there. Or if you prefer, you can leave a comment there. The one thing I ask if you send me email is that you um, include something in the subject line that makes it clear this is not spam, like refer to the show or something, and be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm really lousy about answering email. So with that, let's get on our way. Uh, I'm starting with some good news, as I always like to whenever I can. We have this week some good news in the form of an update. A couple of weeks ago, I told you that the executive committee of the Boy Scouts of America had approved a resolution that would lift the group's blanket ban on gay scoutmasters, uh, rather than that, leaving it up to the individual scout units to decide their own policy on the matter. I said that then at the time that the policy would become uh, permanent, become effective if it was approved by the organization's National Executive Board, what it meant on July 27th. Well, the good news here is that come July 27th, the National Board did just that. They approved by 79% of those present in voting, uh, voted to approve and uh, enforce the executive committee's recommendation and to lift the blanket ban on gay scoutmasters and uh, the new policy is effective immediately. Um, as I said in the wake of the uh, executive committee decision, the move is actually far from perfect uh, because the, what this new policy actually does is, again, it leaves it up to the individual scout units to decide. What it does is empower those individual units to continue banning gay scoutmasters, in other words, allows them to continue to be bigots. Uh, this policy was undoubtedly adopted, this compromise, in order to, um, well, to ease the potentially hurt feelings of groups like the Roman Catholic Church and the Baptist Conventions, which actually sponsor a good number of scout units. However, one church, which apparently is not mollified by the compromise, is the Mormon Church, uh, which actually sponsors more scout units than any other individual organization. The church issued a statement saying it is deeply troubled by the decision, which they claimed is inconsistent with church doctrine, which is kind of strange since the Mormon church actually allows for men who, as they put it, experience same gender attraction, then they don't have to say gay men, but um, those men who experience same gender attraction can be priests and other leaders in the church as long as they remain celibate. So it's hard to see about how this is really against their doctrine, but that's what they said. On the other hand, there were folks who were not so forgiving of the leave it up to the units compromise, the human rights campaign. Pain, for example, said the Boy Scout should not allow any discrimination in any troop units, saying uh, in a statement, quoting, discrimination should have no place in the Boy Scouts, period. Now, for my own part, I agree with the human rights campaign, but I'm prepared to cut the Boy Scouts a little slack, at least for now. I'm sure that the National Board felt itself between the proverbial rock and a hard place, the rock being the changing realities of the world around them, which they could no longer and quite possibly did not want to continue to ignore, uh, but the, um, the hard place being the fact that 70% of local scout units are sponsored by a local church. And in the face of that, uh, of that fact, and the face of declining scout participation, the numbers of active, uh, 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 children active in scouting has been declining slowly but steadily for a good number of years now, the potential loss of all that support undoubtedly was a very daunting prospect. The bottom line here is that this is progress, or more accurately, it reflects progress in our society about the issue of LGBTQ rights. It's not the end, but it's a step on the way. And no matter how you want to look at that, that still means it's good news. 
Now we actually have two footnotes to that. Um, the one is that when I said the decision was not the end of the road about LGBTQ rights, I clearly I meant it. For example, in response to the Boy Scouts decision, Rick Oops Perry repeated his previous statement that openly active gays would be a problem for the Boy Scouts because they would distract from the mission of scouting with sex education. He added, "Nothing. scouting would be better off if they didn't have gay scoutmasters. Now that was foul enough with enough plain old dumb, I mean sex education, I don't know where that came from, but uh, enough plain old dumb mixed in in order to identify it as a Rick Oops Perry statement. So if you want to go to real slime, we have to go to Wisconsin Governor Scott Walk All Over You. He said on July 28th that the Boy Scouts of America should have kept the blanket ban on openly gay, ski, uh, gay scout leaders because that policy, quoting, protected children and advanced scout values. Now that is truly vile. Because no matter how hard his campaign, hours later, try to slice and dice it, no matter how they try to massage it and spin it, the flat, plain, clear meaning of it remains. He's saying and he believes gay men are a threat to children. There is no other rational interpretation of that statement. The Human Rights Campaign responded to Walk All Over You with a statement that, uh, calling his quite revealing comment, quote, offensive, outrageous, and absolutely unacceptable. I think they were way too kind. This man is a real, genuine scumbag. Our other footnote, another quick footnote, is that you may have noticed that I have sometimes referred to LGBT folks and I've sometimes referred to LGBTQ folks, uh, which some people prefer to LGBT. Uh, you quite possibly know that LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. The Q stands for queer or questioning, depending upon who you ask and what their focus is. Queer is more of a political term. It's adopted by those who reject the idea of categorizing people by their sexual desires or sexual orientation, or who just want to reclaim the word queer from an insult to a sort of happy affirmation, and in much in the way that folks in the 60s did with the word freak. Questioning, on the other hand, refers to people, usually young, who are questioning their sexuality, who are questioning where they fit in this spectrum of sexuality, how they relate to themselves and others. Uh, it's a process that's often very stressful. It's, it could even be disorienting. Uh, it can be a very troubling time, and so people who are questioning often need like special support and understanding. Anyway, the point here is that just as I do with global warming and climate change, I will probably flip back and forth between the terms LGBT and LGBTQ, so I wanted to make sure you knew what the latter one meant. All right, next up, we might call this, uh, I might call this my statistic of the week, if I had a regular feature called statistic of the week, which I don't, but here's the statistic of the week. Uh, the FBI and the DHS are 0 for 40, uh, a batting, combined batting average of 0, 0, 0. Now, what does that mean? Since 9-11, the FBI and the DHS, that's the Department of Homeland Security, have issued more than 40 terror warnings about serious threats of potential terrorist attacks in the United States. Some of these warnings mention targets in vague terms like landmarks or airports. Some had somewhat narrower but still like pretty vague terms like New York and Baltimore subways or a Mississippi River bridge. Some had vague geographic locations like the U.S.-Mexico border and uh, parts of California. Some mentioned a nonspecific means of attack, like a chemical or biological or radiological weapon or a dirty bomb. And some mentioned a, you guessed it, vague time frame, like around the 4th of July, around Thanksgiving, around the anniversary of 9-11. The two things, other than their vagueness, all of these warnings had in common was that one, they were released with breathless invocations of threatening terrorism and how we needed to be ever vigilant, and two, none of them happened. 
Not one of these predictions was borne out. More than 40 times over the past, coming up to be 14 years, we've been told to be afraid, be very afraid, because the boogeyman, excuse me, the terrorists, are going to get you. And more than 40 times it has proven bogus. A record that should get the FBI and the DHS sent back to the miners, but of course won't. What brings us up now is that uh, CNN was challenged on its hyperventilating report about a warning of heightened terror alert of ISIS-inspired attacks leading up to this past July 4th weekend. Attacks which, of course, didn't happen. Uh, in response to this challenge, the lead reporter uh, on the story sniped on Twitter, quoting, question is, would you prefer no warnings? Warnings only when attacks imminent? Now, the no warnings part of that can easily be dismissed. Uh, it, it, you know, it's suggesting that the only alternative to repeatedly stoking fears is no warnings at all, uh, which, of course, that's pure bull. I mean, it's an old-fashioned method of what's called arguing by extremes, which, in fact, is no argument at all. But the second part, warnings only when attacks imminent? Yeah, that is what I'd prefer. I prefer that you warn me, that you warn all of us, only when there's actually something to warn us about. Now, some folks say that all these terror attacks are actually very political. They're politically timed and staged. They're a way to keep us in line, to keep us constantly afraid, because a frightened populace is a docile populace. And there's certainly more than enough evidence in our history and in our shorter evidence of terror alerts to make that at least a reasonable proposition. But even if, as is also plausible, the FBI and the DHS are just being bureaucratic hacks who are trying to cover their butts because they don't fear terrorist attacks so much as they fear the effect on their careers and their departmental budgets if one happens, which they didn't predict, the result is the same. We are being conditioned to being always afraid. And even if there's no other impact to this, no other impact except to that, that constant fear of terrorism, something psychologists call terror salience, that constant fear is corrosive to society. This has been demonstrated by psychological research. It makes us harsher, colder, quicker to be suspicious of anything or anyone different, quicker to punish, quicker to judge, slower to understand or forgive. A people cannot live in constant fear and maintain a sense of decency. And I think it's safe to say uh, that a sense of decency is something we have been losing. Not because of terrorism, but because of the irrational and unwarranted fear of it. So the next time you hear about a terror alert, just think to yourself, oh, for 40. All right, we have now uh, two updates I want to bring to you. First has to do with, the plan, with Planned Parenthood of America. The, uh, the impact of those doctored videos being used to attack Planned Parenthood, that impact is banging around the halls of Congress, eagerly echoed there by the, uh, by the usual collection of right-wing twits there and in the echo chamber of right-wing media. Uh, but it does not seem to be penetrating a lot beyond that, at least not yet. According to a new poll, which was commissioned by Planned Parenthood to measure the impact of the videos, nearly two-thirds of Americans, American voters, uh, say that they are against a proposal to strip federal funding from Planned Parenthood. Less than 30 percent are in favor, and just a quarter of the people said they would choose a congressional candidate who advocated defunding Planned Parenthood over one that would advocate continuing to fund it. When presented with the claims made about the video, which was uh, the claims made by the anti-abortion group that made the video, along with Planned Parenthood's response, more than half of those polled said that they would tend to believe Planned Parenthood over the other group. Only a quarter would lean toward the anti-choicers. And despite the usual bloating and bloviating and bleeding from the right, the majority of the American public, what this means is the majority of the American public is still prepared to say, I stand with Planned Parenthood against those who would destroy it. As a sidebar, by the way, I expect that part of the reason for those survey results is the fact that a quarter of the women polled said that they themselves had visited a Planned Parenthood clinic for health care. Now, this, of course, won't stop the fanatics and their dutiful mouthpieces, because facts never do. Uh, 
In the House of Representatives, a resolution has been, been introduced with 135 co-sponsors calling on the Justice Department to investigate Planned Parenthood. And in the Senate, Senate Majority Leader, Majority Leader Fishface McConnell is fast-tracking a resolution to cut off all federal funding for Planned Parenthood. On the other hand, what the results should do, these results should stiffen the spines of those in Congress who would want to stand against that kind of move. The thing to understand here is that this is nothing new. The attacks on Planned Parenthood are ancient. These kind of attacks go back over 10 years. It's part of a regular right-wing strategy, which is to attack the strong target. Attack the big target. Figuring if you take that one down, the smaller ones will follow on their own. Uh, just compare. The case of, of Kermit Gosnell made a splash, but ultimately had little, if any, impact because he was just one guy. In fact, You've already forgotten him, haven't you? He was the Philadelphia abortion provider who was now in prison serving life without parole after being convicted just two years ago of killing viable fetuses after abortions, along with a host of other grisly crimes. Oh yeah, you remember him now, but that's the point you had to be reminded. Because he was just one individual. A particularly slimy one, but still one person. The right wing doesn't care about him, doesn't care about one person, one slimy doctor, except as that case can be exploited as a symbol. The idea is you don't go after one crooked abortionist, you go after the most effective advocate for women's health and a woman's right to choose. And you are prepared to lie through your teeth in order to do it. That is what is going on with the Planned Parenthood videos, and you keep that in mind. Okay, one other update before the break. Uh, two weeks ago, I told you that it was being predicted that the State Department's new annual report on human trafficking, the human slave trade, would upgrade Malaysia from Tier 3, the group of the worst offenders, to Tier 2. The reason this is important is that Fast Track Authority on the still-secret Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal said that any nation in Tier 3 could not benefit from that deal which means that Malaysia was out of the deal, which meant, according to the White House, the whole deal could fall apart. If Malaysia could be moved to Tier 2, well, then everything's back on track. The update here is that, yep, the SOBs did it. They moved Malaysia out of Tier 3, a shift that, according to Human Rights Watch, was, quote, so extraordinarily unwarranted that political interference can be presumed. I said it then, I say it now. The depth of moral corruption to which this administration will sink in order to do the bidding of the banks is almost incomprehensible. We're taking a break. And we're back. All right, so here's the scene. A guy named Dustin Lee Gunnels is driving in Towns County, Georgia, in rural Georgia, on July 15th. He's stopped by the cops for some infraction or another. He's uncooperative. He reaches for a gun. The cops break his car window and grab him. He reaches for another gun, this one in a holster in the small of his back. The cops, according to the official statement, get him, quote, under control and disarm him, unquote. Okay, uncooperative driver actually reaches for an actual gun, not once, but twice. Both guns, by the way, were loaded, and the one from the small of his back was cocked. He is under arrest, but he's alive and well, not dead. And if you wanted to take a guess about his race, you'd be right. Which brings me to something I want to say. I've been wanting to say this, but it involves a rather long introduction. In response to the call of Black Lives Matter, the chant of Black Lives Matter against politicians, the, the movement that has become known as Black Lives Matter, a number of people among our pundit and political classes, as well as some well-intentioned ordinary people, uh, have responded with, well, all lives matter which simultaneously declares their supposed concern with the issues that the movement is raising, while at the same time scolding that movement for their supposedly narrow, self-interested focus. Because, well, I'm in interested in everyone, not just certain people. Well, 
The fact is that all lives matter, that phrase, completely misses the point in some cases, and it intends to distract from the point in other cases. All lives matter would be a valid response if we actually acted like all lives matter. If we actually acted like all lives were equal in our eyes, if we actually treated all lives equally. But we don't. We treat some lives as better than others. We treat some lives as more deserving than others. We act as if some lives are just inherently more valuable than others. So let's go down the list from birth to death. The infant mortality rate among blacks in this country is double that of whites. Black preschoolers are far more likely to be suspended than white preschoolers. They make up 18% of the preschool population, but half of all suspensions. In the K-12 to years, black children are three times more likely to be suspended than white children. They make up almost 40% of all expulsions. Even disabled black children are affected by this. About a fifth of all disabled children are black, but they account for over 40% of disabled children who are put in mechanical restraints or set in seclusion. Black children are 18 times more likely to be sentenced as adults in courts than white children are. They make up nearly 60% of children in prison. In juvenile detention proceedings, black juveniles are much more likely to be treated as adults than their white counterparts. Education, which we claim is the great equalizer, isn't. Black college graduates are twice as likely to be unemployed as white college graduates, and in fact the overall unemployment rate for blacks is double that of whites and has been for decades. A study actually found that people with black-sounding names had to send out 50% more job applications than people with white-sounding names in order to get a call back. For every $10,000 increase in pay, the percentage of blacks holding that position declined 7% compared to whites. The higher in the scale you go, the fewer blacks there are there. About 75% of whites own homes, only 43% of blacks. The gap between median household income for whites and blacks in this country is staggering. Median household income for whites is about $91,000 a year. For blacks, it's 7000 and that gap has actually tripled in the last 25 years. The median net worth of white families is about $265,000. It's $28,500, a little more than one-tenth as much for black families. A black man is three times as likely as a white man to be searched at a traffic stop, six times more likely to be arrested. Not because they're more prone to criminal behavior, rather a study by the Sentencing Project said that there is, quote, an implicit racial association of black Americans with dangerous or aggressive behavior. Basically, we assume black people are criminals. On the New Jersey Turnpike, blacks make up 15% of drivers, more than 40% of traffic stops, and 73% of arrests, even though by actual observations they violate traffic laws at about the same rate as white people do. In New York City, blacks were three times as likely as whites to be stopped and frisk. Black Americans are also uh, 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 victimized by the so-called war on drugs. Despite roughly equal usage rates, blacks are nearly four times as likely as whites to be arrested for marijuana possession. If a black person kills a white person, they are nearly twice as likely to be sentenced to death as a white person who kills a black. If you're black, local prosecutors are much more likely to upgrade a charge to felony conviction, felony murder rather than if you're white. Black people are sentenced to prison terms that are up to 20% longer than white people for essentially the same crimes. They are 38% more likely to be sentenced to death than whites for the same crimes. And a young black man is 21 times more likely to be killed by a cop than a young white man is. And yet we refuse to face it. The National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago uh, did a study using a weighted questionnaire with a range of possible answers which was designed to reveal un unrecognized uh, as, long, as well as unadmitted biases. The results, more than half of respondents rated blacks as less intelligent than whites, 62% rated them as lazier than whites, more than three out of four said that African Americans are more likely than whites to prefer welfare to work and yet we refuse to face it.
On a test developed uh, at the University of North Carolina, m most white people who took the test discovered that they associate blacks with guns and white people with tools. And yet we refuse to face it. In fact, we'll go out of our way to avoid facing it. There's newly published research out of Stanford University. What they did is they had two groups of people. Uh, these are all white people, all white subjects. Half of them, they showed them a paragraph about uh, white privilege. The other half, they didn't. Then each one took a questionnaire about their childhood memories. Those who had been exposed to evidence of white privilege were considerably more likely to claim great obstacles in their youth which they had to overcome than those who hadn't. In short, they colored their personal narrative in order to discount the, uh, the white privilege. They may recognize the existence of white privilege in, in the abstract, but in the reality, they just find ways to say, oh no, there may be white privilege, but I wasn't privileged. I didn't get any benefit from it. We refuse to face it. We even adjust our memories in order to enable us to refuse to face it. Which brings me back to all lives matter and the thing that I wanted to say, which is that I wanted to say to all of you out there, any of you who may at any time have thought some variation, any variation of, well, sure, black lives matter because all lives matter, don't they? All lives matter. All lives matter is a misdirection. It is a trap. The phrase all lives matter looks to take the harsh reality of racism that affects African Americans from birth to death, from day to day, week to week, year to year. It looks to take the daily stresses, the daily strains of things like seeing a cop car in your rearview mirror and having to worry whether or not your rear license plate is on crooked. It looks to take the hundred daily slights and cuts of the suspicious looks from security guards and store clerks. It looks to take the unemployment, the poverty, the circumscribed futures. It looks to take the institutional racism and police violence that make the cry Black Lives Matter necessary in the first place. The vapid phrase, all lives matter, looks to take all of that and immerse it, sink it, drown it in a thick, syrupy, sweet, sticky goo of greeting card sentimentality. It's a vapid saying. It's the social equivalent of a sugar cookie intended to make us feel better without actually meaning a damn thing. Yeah, all lives matter, sure. And when we start acting like we really believe that, it will become a reasonable response to the moral call of Black Lives Matter, and not before. That's it. We're done. We're out of here. Um, I want to thank everybody who's made responses to the show. I do welcome them, even if they're critical. I do welcome all responses. So remember, whoviating at AOL.com. But for now, you just have the best week you possibly can. We will see you here next week. And for now, as always, peace.